Yeah. Whatever you want. Okay. All right. Yes. Dan. All right. All right. Let me put record on. All right. It looks like it is recording now. See, uh, it all makes me nervous. Make sure I'm doing it. It's recording. Okay, Dan. I'll give. I'll give five, four. Okay. Let's go. Hi, everybody. This is the Jiggy Jaguar Show. Welcome. This is Roger Homefield. I'll be sitting in for Jiggy today. And we've got with us Dan Perkins. You've seen him before. He's one of the more popular guests that we have. Uh, he's an author. Uh, he's got so many hats that you really have to dive into the things he does. Uh, he's a commentator. He's got lots of different shows. He's a TV radio personality. And he's a veteran. And most importantly, everything he seems to be involved with is to help other people. And you're going to know that when you see him. And Dan, uh, welcome back to the show. I know this is a stomping grounds for you, but where should the folks go to really see the full Dan Perkins? What's the website? Uh, the best one is probably to go to danperkins.guru, which is a link to all the other websites and also has the stories on my books and uh, interviews and, and commentaries. Uh, danperkins.guru is the place to go. All right. Is there a book that you wanted to talk about today? Your latest book, perhaps? Well, my latest book is called Sad Eyes, which you and I did an interview some time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a story. It's a it's really a it's a historical romance novel. It's set in um, World War Two. And uh, our lead person in the script in the in the book, um, Mary Ellen Murphy, is a Born in Waterloo, Iowa in 1912. In her sophomore year of high school, she decides she wants to be a nurse. Her parents, as all parents, say, well, why can't you go to school here? Why do you have to go someplace else? And they, she doesn't want to tell them, I just need to get out of town and, and see something bigger than Waterloo, Iowa. And so uh, she knows that if she stays in Waterloo, uh, like a lot of young women in Waterloo, after the senior prom, She's probably going to have sex and get pregnant and have three kids and stuck in Waterloo. And she doesn't want to do that. So she makes a, a commitment to herself. No intercourse, period. She's not going to jeopardize her career as a nurse helping people for one minute of pleasure. And so she gets accepted to St. James School in uh, Chicago on the west side where they bring all the mobsters that get shot into gun battles. And she works in the a hospital and then works in the emergency room and she's in a three-year program to get her certification as a nurse um, and uh, she is first in her class and has a wonderful relationship with a young lady from Brooklyn New York who's in the same nursing program and she thought she was in the same mental philosophy as as Mary Ellen but what in that time, you went to school for 50 weeks a year, 50 weeks straight. You had two weeks off and come back again. And you do that for three years and you get your nursing certification. So uh, they go to school and, and they, uh, their first year, they, they uh, spent the whole time studying and working in the hospital. And they didn't get to see any of Chicago except what they saw from the hospital. So they make a commitment that in the second year, they're going to see more of the city and meet people and uh, have a good time while they're in college. And they do, and they meet these guys, and they go to baseball games and bars and restaurants and on Rush Street and, and have a great time. Time for them to go home for the two-week leave in the summer, and they both girls go home. And when Mary Ellen comes back in September, her roommate isn't there. And the administration won't tell her why she didn't come back. So she takes a handful of nickels and goes out to the payphone in the lobby and starts calling her and uh, can't get her. And her mother says she doesn't want to talk and she keeps being persistent. And finally, she gets a hold of her roommate and her roommate tells her that she's pregnant and they won't let her come back to school, which is what she thought she had convinced this young woman that it was the right thing to do because you may give up your entire career for a, a few moments of pleasure. Uh, she never goes back to nursing. She never hears from her again. 
she gets a new roommate who has had a unfortunate situation where her roommate also got pregnant and didn't come back. So the two of them commiserate with each other and they become roommates and become friends for the rest of their lives. And um, after she's uh, uh, been, she's finished her schooling, graduates first in her class and gets a full-time job working at the hospital, the head nurse for the hospital comes to her and says, I think you should become a go back to school, become a charge nurse and be in charge of the ER. She doesn't want to spend another year in Chicago, but because she hates the weather. And her roommate has left Chicago and is living in San Diego working as a nurse, just beating on her unmercifully about why are you still there? You don't want to be there. It's too cold. Come over. And anyway, she thinks it's good for her career to, to become a charge nurse. So she, she enrolls, enrolls in LaSalle University. And um, she's in the library, and this guy is looking, looking at her. Now, she's an incredibly attractive, red-haired, green-eyed, gorgeous Irish lass. And he finally gets up over and gets over and has enough courage to come over and, and says, I got to tell you, I'm sure you've had this before. You're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. And she blushes and he asked her for coffee and they she says, well, we, there's a coffee shop around the corner. She knows they got tables and they got booths. She feels she might be safer. And he introduces himself again and he says, I'm a special agent with the FBI. And she's kind of taken back a little bit. And so the story goes on about what happens there. And literally, I signed the agreement today that book two, the second part of the story is getting ready to be published and should be out. Early, early next month. So I write, I try and write different things. I've written four books on nuclear terrorism against the United States that people think are right out of the headlines. Um, I've written three children's books. And I have another book that's finished that I'm working with a publisher, and that's Abraham Lincoln and the Second Assassin. But I also, as Jim says, hog more, but more than my share of ink and paper because I write current events commentary all the time. And what I'd like to do is to have a conversation with you about what's going on in the world today and see how we agree or disagree. Sure. Uh, so I want to ask you, um, were you surprised at the outcome of the, Manch the New Hampshire primary? No, I wasn't surprised. Uh, I thought he would have won by a slightly larger margin. But things have gone pretty much as I expected, frankly, as far as from last year when they had the midterm and uh, the Republicans didn't do that well and uh, DeSantis did very well. Uh, things have, I, I, I don't want to take credit, but I mean, I mean, uh, to be honest with you, things have gone pretty much the way I expected. I, I didn't think that that midterm was going to knock uh, Trump off the horse. I thought he was going to like uh, trounce across the finish line and uh, that appears to be what's happening. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, but but I think that um, a lot of people in the in especially in Iowa mm -hmm. and in New Hampshire, the Democratic Party has made no bones about they want to pick our candidate. They right. want to pick the worst possible candidate to run against Joe Biden. And so what happened in Iowa? Democratic Party spent $11 million in advertising pushing the candidate, uh, Nikki Haley from South Carolina, uh, as a better choice than Donald Trump. In addition, because it was an open caucus, Democrats could come over and vote in the open caucus. So they encouraged uh, as many Democratic people as possible to cross over and vote for Nikki Haley. But in, in the case of uh, Iowa, she only got about 8% of the vote. Mm -hmm. Now, DeSantis got more and he walked away. So we come into New Hampshire. Again, the Democrats trying to pick our candidate do the same thing in New Hampshire that they did in, in, in uh, Iowa. And that is Spent a lot of money on advertising, promoting her as a better choice than Donald Trump, and encouraged over 3,000 people or more 
to re-register and become Republicans to be able to vote in the primary. And she got 41 or 42 percent of the vote. But if you begin to think about it, if they were the Democrats were pressing hard that they wanted Nikki Haley to be the candidate, they, they spent a lot of money and a lot of energy and effort to try and get her to beat Trump, and he she still couldn't do it. She still lost by 12 points. That's, mm-hmm. in most people's mind, embarrassing. Now she's got a problem. She finished second out of two. Mm-hmm. He beat her by 12 points. And she's staring down the barrel of a an unusual situation in South Carolina. The unusual situation is they're going to have in March, they're going to have a presidential preference primary. And then in June, they'll have the regular primary. So the presidential preference for the Republicans will be Nikki Haley and Donald Trump. The polling data shows right now that Trump is ahead of her by 30 points plus. Mm. Why does she why does she want to walk into her home state and get beat up by 20 or 30 points and think that she's a contender? Why would she do that? The answer is the big money politics driven by the Democrats are pressuring her to stay in and continue her message because they they, they want to see if she can beat Mr. Trump. She can't beat Mr. Trump going into South Carolina and losing by 20 to 30 points. Can't happen. So she's wasting time, energy, and money. And it seems to me that when the March presidential preference vote is to take it in in South Carolina, she's done or should be done. Then the question becomes, and I'd be interested in your your opinion, mm-hmm. if if Trump is the only left one left standing, should they cancel the rest of the Republican primaries? I would think so. I mean there's no point. I mean, you know, it should just be he's the presumptive nominee and go forward. I mean For me personally, and I know you don't agree with me on, I know we don't agree. I agree with you on like 99% of everything. And I would, I would like to think uh, vice versa. Um, But I thought they should have done that from the beginning. Me. I mean, I just thought it was where we are now. I just thought that to me, it was obvious that that's where we're going to be. It didn't mean that I knew anything. I just happened to be right. Uh, But at this point, yeah. How can you have a primary if nobody else is running? (laughs) How, How would you even do that? Well, the question I would ask you is, should the state Democratic Committee collapse the primary and give all the votes to Donald Trump? I don't know, Dan. That one's over my head. I'll tell you, when you get into the parties of the other party coming in and voting on your primary to try to skewer uh, the results you want, to try to get the results they want, to have the weaker candidate, et cetera, that's just a little too convoluted for me. I uh, I don't know. You tell me. Seriously. I think one of the biggest mistakes the Democratic Party made was the decision to limit the number of primaries that they were going to have and the number of ballots that Joe Biden would be on. Mm-hmm. And here's the problem. We have a constitutional right to vote as legitimate citizens when you say no, we're not going to let you vote. We're going to do, we're going to automatically de- proclaim that Joe Biden is the not the presumptive nominee. He will be the nominee, and they'll assign the necessary votes from the states that haven't had primaries yet, and give that to Joe Biden so he walks in the door. I believe you disenfranchised the rank and file of the Democratic Party. Same thing would be true. If the Republicans closed down the primaries and awarded and awarded the delegates to Donald Trump with no election, that's not what it's about. We're allowed to give people a voice. And the the one voice that is so guarded by the Constitution is the right to vote. And even if there's only one candidate, 
you still give the people the right to vote because there may be other candidates who are lesser candidates who have no chance, but people would like to support that person, at least in the interim, till we get to the till we get to the convention. So no, I don't think we close down the primaries. But I think what we do is we send Mr. Trump around the country, not campaigning for the primaries, but actually starting the 2024 presidential mm -hmm. campaign. Well, I'll buy that, Dan. Sold. Bought. I, I agree with you 100%. I, I, I think you're right. And uh, that's a good point. People should have the right to vote, whether, even if it's a write-in or whatever, go through the process. But yes, let, let's get this thing uh, uh, moving. Dan, let me ask you about something. Something sure. some of the boys are talking about today in the dugout of my senior softball game. So this is not like in the halls of Yale necessarily, but they're all different backgrounds, a lot of smart cookies. They were talking about how the candidates running for president, once they drop out of the race, get to keep the money that was brought in for the campaign. And could, could you explain that to us? And it, sure. it, it doesn't <clears throat> make a lot of sense. The, the candidates raise money from donors <clears throat> and it goes to, to a political committee some some of the money goes to the the democrat or republican national committee but there's x amount of dollars and there's x amount of dollars that are assigned to the candidates campaign fund <clears throat> at the end of the campaign if the candidate has lost any unspent capital cash goes to the candidate, free and clear. If he's, if he's got bills to pay, he has to pay off bills before he takes the money. But <clears throat> um, you'll notice everybody's suspending their campaigns. Suspending, yes. Suspending their campaigns, which is freezing of spending no more money. Now, the problem is that in past years, some candidates have borrowed against their personal wealth to fund their campaign. And if they lose, they still have to pay the bills. And there are been, have been donor, examples of donors who have put up money to help pay off their campaign bills. But yes, if you, if you run a campaign and you raise a lot of money and you don't spend it all and you don't get elected, you have a right to claim it as yours. Dan, do you think that that uh, promotes people staying in the race longer than they really should or need to or even want to? Are they staying in the race longer to bring in more and more cash? Uh, that's certainly a possibility. However, to, to look at your question, um, the money has to come in from donors. If you're doing well, you didn't win Iowa, you didn't win New Hampshire, and you didn't win uh, South Carolina, your, your own state, there's a real good possibility that there's going to be very little money coming in because you are not perceived to be a viable candidate. So that candidate, this is the issue for M Nikki Haley. She's the last candidate standing except for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. She's got campaign money. She's continuing, quote, the fight with Donald Trump to win the party nomination. But at some point in time, the big donors will start to walk away from her because she's no longer a viable candidate. The, the decision that she has to make is, do I go into debt when I spent all the campaign funds? Do I borrow millions of dollars mm. to continue or do I shut it down? Those people who have left the Republican race have decided that they would not want to risk their personal fortunes in trying to do a campaign that isn't going to work. Dan, let me ask you something about uh, about the border. Well, just really in general, when there's a threat to this country from within, from our own administration, for example. So I guess the question is, if we could all see that what's happening at the border is by design, uh, I think at this point it should be obvious they want the border open. They want people to come over and vote Democrat. And this really is all they're trying to do. And they don't really seem to care about the safety and welfare of these poor people that are coming up. You know, there's a lot of people in this country that are angry at the illegal immigrants for coming up, but they have been invited up here. And now look what's happening, Dan. They come up here, 
Then they get the backlash from the American public, make the American public look like bad guys when the American public, in fact, have the biggest hearts of anybody in the entire world. And it's just a disgusting situation for everyone. So at what point, uh, we see Governor Abbott doing some uh, things out in Texas, but at what point can a government be declared rogue and cease and desist from what they're doing? I know that uh, uh, it's not a legal question. I don't know law. It just seems that if you know that your own administration is literally working against the interests of the United States of America, and I think if we look back at the last three years, I don't know how else, well, I suppose people could spin anything any way they want. But let's just stick with the border, I suppose. When we have a situation like this, where all you have to do is temporarily close the border, take a breath, and then decide what policies you're going to have. Uh, at what point, Dan, do, do, do you just have to go down and, and keep marching like the British did when they got picked off one by one before they decided, hey, maybe we should scatter? Well, see, I, th I think there are, there are issues that are not being put on the table that I think need to be put on the table. Let me let me give you a couple of them. Um, when Joe Biden took over as president of the United States, he was elected with a 91% positive rating from the Democratic Party black voters, 91%. In history, a Democratic nominee who doesn't get at least 85% of the black vote in this country will never win. Now, add to that that the predominance of people coming across our southern border were not necessarily black. They were from 150 nations around the world. Mm -hmm. The Democrats realized that under Donald Trump, blacks had great success. They were able to find jobs. They got good paying jobs. They were able to buy homes and cars and began the process of economic prosperity. Biden had to stop that. But knowing that when he stops that, there's going to be a backlash, he had to build replacements. And the people coming across the border illegally were the people that were ultimately going to be the replacements for the blacks in our elective process. And if you think about all the things that we gave them and continue to give them, they didn't even give to the black people. They gave them to the refugees. So they're building a, a group of people, millions upon millions of people who potentially could be, if they're allowed to stay here, a new base for the Democratic Party. And there's nothing we can do about it, although we see this happening right in front of our eyes. We know what the nope. intentions are. They're very nefarious. They're certainly not for the American interest. It's un-American. It's cruel to the people that are coming up. It's cruel to the people in this country that are, are, are losing uh, various facilities, et cetera, even schools. And, and uh, we've got veterans being tossed out of uh, old age homes. Uh, there's a better term for that, I know. But uh, I get it. we just have to squeeze our legs until the election, Dan. Is, that's about all we can do, huh? Well, we can, we can certainly vote these people out when we have the opportunity. Uh, we can certainly protest, put pressure on our congressmen and senators. And and the idea here is a voice. And that's what I, we talked about earlier. We need a voice. Voting is a, is a voice. And I, I think that what we're dealing with is a situation where we have to begin taking control, meaning the people, of what's going on. And until, until we do that, we're going to allow the left to control the situation. And yes, there are laws on the books that should stop what's been going on at the border. But in December, we had 302,000 illegals come across. And in October, November, December, we had another 100,000, they estimate, estimate another 100,000 who were getaways. 
who were never caught. So we're, we're, we're dealing with northern cities and border towns that are being bankrupt with the cost. What's fascinating to me is I hear the mayor of New York and Chicago and Los Angeles talking about the homeless problem and the refugee problem. I don't hear anybody say the single person responsible for this mess, this disaster, was Joe Biden. Because Joe Biden was the one who used an executive order he signed to get rid of all the stuff we were doing. So he is accountable for the conditions in the cities around this country who are being forced to take people who are refugees from the border. My concern is that we are at 300,000 plus. The, the stuff that I hear about what has happened in the month of January, it could be that January could be higher than December. I believe that between now and the election, there's going to be a decision made. And this decision is going to be either Joe Biden is going to stop immigration coming across the southern border. And if he does that, how much warning is he going to give the illegals to get here before he does? Right. If, the, if it looks like he is going to necessarily have to do something drastic to try and stop it, you're going to see a surge, a further surge mm -hmm. of people coming. And I suspect between now and the conventions, we may see a month with 500,000 illegals coming into this country. And so uh, the, 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 the president and the illegals have a question that the, each of them has to deal with. Am I going to continue to let them in, President Biden? And what happens, the illegals, what happens if I'm sitting at home thinking about coming north or wherever I'm coming from, and I believe that Joe Biden isn't going to do something serious about the border, and I may never get in, right. a huge rush to get in now. You know what else the mayors are not saying, Dan, is Mayor Adams, yeah, he's doing all this complaining and this and that, but, but what he's not saying is, we are no longer a sanctuary city. Don't come because we are no longer a sanctuary city. Uh, am I wrong, Dan? I mean, isn't that something they should be saying? Sure. But they're not saying it. They're, they just want... They want more money from the federal government yeah. to cover the cost. I mean, look look at the, the hotels that have been acquired yeah. and turned into homeless shelters, schools, um, yeah. other buildings in New York City alone that have turned into homeless shelters. Now, I'm going to take your situation, this situation. I want to twist it just a little bit for you. Mm -hmm. When our country was going through the process of being born. One of the things that the American citizen absolutely detested was the British monarchy were stationing, stationing soldiers in people's homes. And they had to feed them and take care of them out of their own pockets. And the American, the American patriots said no. Uh, 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 we're not going to take soldiers and, and, and board them in our homes. We're not going to board the enemy in our homes. But if you think about it, with the millions of people that have come across the border, we're being invaded by an army of illegals. Yes. And now we have a congressman who's thinking about we should uh, have to open up our homes to take illegals in our homes. What won't they come up with, Dan? Uh, they must have been <laughs> raised on the Twilight Zone and figured that that was normal, along with Alfred E. Newman's Mad Magazine. I mean, we're all upside down here. Uh, use any analogy you want. You know, you mentioned 500,000 people before. And that brings me back to hearing about the uh, two Columbia professors called Cloward and Piven. And Glenn Beck used to talk about this 15 years ago, that their theory was that the United States should taken all this debt and all kinds of programs so that America would just collapse under the weight of its own debt. And that's what this sounds like will do to the country. 
And this is yet just another attack on our country. And, and it's it's frustrating, Dan, because, uh, you know, the, the founders were geniuses and they foresaw a lot of problems that could happen. And they built mm -hmm. that into the Constitution, right? Like checks and balances right. and this and that. But maybe they never foresaw something like this. And I just hope we can make it to that election to where the election, it won't be too late to turn things around once we get there. Mm hmm. So in the time we have left, I want to ask you another question. Yeah. Recent polling data say that the, th the top three most popular candidates for president are Donald Trump first, Joe Biden second. Who do you think is third? Uh, I, I'm surprised that Biden is second. Uh, What's the question again? The, the, the top who the, the top picks for president are Trump. Surveys Biden. have been conducted. Surveys have been conducted about mm -hmm. the three most popular candidates for president. Right. Donald Trump was first. Joe Biden second. I'm asking you who was number three. Uh, I'm going to guess DeSantis. Michelle Obama. Oh, that's right. What am I thinking? What is wrong with it? I apologize. I had a brain disaster there. Of course, Michelle Obama. And this is what I'm afraid of. I mean, I'm expecting them to pull a switcheroo before the election. I'm expecting Biden to step down and Michelle Obama is going to swoop in like Wonder Woman, like, oh, she's a, and what a disaster. I mean, this is the woman that was never proud of the United States of America, her adult life until until Obama was nominated as president and became president, uh, that would be a disaster for patriots, and it certainly would be a disaster for me. Well, what's your feeling about that, Dan? Do you think America is going to get swooned by that, or do you think it'll? Uh, do you think that it would really change things? I look at it and I, I, un, I look at it and say that the Michelle and Barack are narcissist first class. Oh yeah. And I say, how is a two-term president, Barack Obama, going to be, how is he going to feel that he's going to have to give up his title of president and become first gentleman to Michelle Obama? You're not going to happen. You're not going to give it up. Wait a second. Wait, wait, wait. Let me see if I understand you there. You're saying that that Obama wouldn't want Michelle to become president? I'm saying that the people who are suggesting yeah. that Michelle would be the candidate for president are not looking at the narcissistic tendencies. So I'm saying that a man who served in the highest office in the land for two, two terms, who has the right to, to continue to be called Mr. President, can't be called Mr. President, if he's in the White House because his wife is president, he would have to take the name First Gentleman. But he'd still be calling the shots, or a lot of them. Could 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 be. We just don't know how much influence Michelle really has. So number two, um, if you if you are somewhat narcissistic in your tendencies. You'd want to make sure there was a good possibility that you could win. And the question is, you take a yellow notepad, draw a line down the middle, and one side is pro and the other side is con. Yeah. One of the things that will be on the column side of the paper is independence, freedom, and great wealth. She and her husband make $60 million in all the activities that they have. Why would they want to give that up just to be president of the United States? And would you want to be president of the United States as a Democrat with a Republican House and Senate? Well, I hope we don't have to find out because that's actually my biggest fear is that she is going to run and that that would be a lot tougher candidate than, uh, than uh, President Biden. So I hope it does not come to pass. Uh, even if it's their own egos that would prevent it, fine, whatever it takes. Um, but let me give you let me give you a recent example of something. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the scandal with the president of Harvard and her 
lack of support for Jews and support for Hamas and murdering hundreds and thousands of Jews. Sure. She lost her job, not because of that. <laughs> she lost her job because of plagiarism. Right. But why did she go, why was she not as quickly dispatched as the woman who was president of MIT? Because they got two, two boxes checked off with her, black minority, female. So Michelle Obama, black, female, has an advantage. You know, it's so insane, Dan, because you and I are similar. We were born around the same time in our entire lives. We were brought up. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter your religion. None of this matters. All that matters is who you are and what you do and what you have to offer. And now, and now look around us. It's the exact opposite. It's not who you are. It's not what you've done. It's not what you want to do for other people. It's what color you are, what religion you are, what sex you are. And how could this insanity become the norm? when it, 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 it's against common sense, but it's also against everything we've learned our entire lives. Yep. And the idea that, that if you don't agree with the left, you're a racist. They can call me racist up and down, okay? I just lost my wife. She was a black Cuban, uh, Hispanic. She was a, uh, you know, so they can really put it in their ear or where the sun don't shine, as Colonel Alan West used to say. Uh, folks, I want to I want to tell you about Dan Perkins, uh, something he did as a veteran. And I'm just I just saw something here the other day. And it says seeing the number of suicides of veterans amount to a staggering 22 each day in the United States and the overwhelming effects of on both veterans and their families who suffer from PTSD. Dan and his wife, Jerry. Founded songs and stories for soldiers. Uh, I'm not going to read this off. I'm going to let you describe it. But it's a very generous thing you're doing. It's thoughtful. It's insightful. And you're getting in the heads of the people receiving this stuff and what can be uplifting to them. And God bless you for what you're doing. Let the folks know about this. Songs and Stories and Soldiers was founded by my wife and I based on a, um, a revelation from the Lord. And he told me uh, that that I needed to take care of my brothers and sisters in the military, especially those who were injured. So we we fought with the government, and we, we w struggled, and we started an organization called Songs and Stories for Soldiers, and it's specifically designed to deal with veterans who are suffering either from a traumatic brain injury, PTSD, sleep deprivation, which is a huge issue, and of course, veteran suicide. And we give away to veteran service organizations like the VA hospitals and other private entities a, an MP3 system that gives the veteran um, three novels to listen to. Uh, and on the website, there are over a mil three million songs, over a hundred thousand audiobooks and 35,000 old time radio shows that can be downloaded free on the MP3 player. And we give the MP3 player to the veteran and we give them free access to the website to download content. We started in, in uh, 2011 and we've, we're now in, have presented our program in about 135 veterans facilities and have given away about 28,000 of our MP players for free. And what's interesting is that, as I said briefly, sleep deprivation is the biggest issue. Sleep deprivation causes a transit to suicide and all to, also to, to PTSD. Sleep deprivation doesn't allow the, the veteran to make the right decisions because they're exhausted, they're fatigued, their body is, is suffering from uh, lack of sleep. And so we have an eight hour custom designed sleep audio on the MP3 system 
that is designed to get the soldier, the veteran, to REM level sleep. REM level sleep, whether in the military or whether we're just mom and dad, REM level sleep is where the healing process begins. Because if I get if I get REM level sleep, the body can begin and soul can begin to heal itself. So it's a it's a mission that we've been doing for a long time, and we continue to support organizations that do this. And um, it's a it's a wonderful thing that we've been able to do. I've visited hospitals all over the country, and talked to veterans. And uh, uh, we sponsored a couple of years the. Uh, the honor flight where the veterans could fly to Washington, D.C., and we provided our MP3 systems for all the veterans on the flights. And um, we uh, we do whatever we can, whenever we can, to try and help our brothers and sisters. And you that's, know, the government, the government's not doing this for people, but you and your wife are. That's songsandstoriesforsoldiers.us is the website where you can go and learn about it and make a donation. Time has really flown by, but uh, I before we go, I just I don't want to get this screwed up. Is it danperkins.guru or Dan? Danperkins.guru. Danperkins.guru. Now, don't get if you do look up, that will show all the different websites he has because there's a plethora of stuff that he's done. If you just go on Google, just so you know, his middle initial is M. It will be Daniel M. Perkins. But if you go to if you go to danperkins.guru, you'll have all his links right there and see all the great stuff he does right uh thanks so much for passing your time with us today dan uh, it's great to get to know you it, it's my pleasure and my honor to do so folks this is the jiggy jaguar show thanks for being here this is roger homefield sitting in for jiggy and we'll see you next time thanks and have a great night i think we're done <laughs>